Hello everybody and welcome to this my video on the Umeka DX3. This camera by the way came under a, a lot of different badges including the Bell & Howell 35J and the Citicon ST3. We'll, we'll get to this one in a minute. So here are some photos taken with the 35J and then a few more taken with this, the Umeka DX3 so you can kind of see how these cameras perform. We're going to go over this video using the DX3 because uh, it is like the quintessential version of this camera. And what I mean by version, we'll cover that in a little bit. This is the Umeka DX3. It is a toy grade 35mm viewfinder camera. It has no light meter despite that sticker there which kind of looks like a light meter. No light meter. It has a guillotine shutter. Okay, what does that mean? A guillotine shutter is a type of shutter that's similar to a leaf shutter. See if you can see in here. The way that guillotine shutters work is basically it's like a primitive leaf shutter. You have two pieces of metal, right? And you have your shutter opening here, and then you have one piece of metal that, or plastic, but I think in both of these it's metal, that, that flips upward, reveals the, sh the, um, the, sh the, the, the aperture, the lens opening right here, and then another piece of metal closes behind it. And then when you rearm, this one drops down to cover and then that one goes back behind. So it's called a guillotine because the shutter action is a chopping motion. The shutter speeds on this are ha ha, who knows? That's, that is what the outline says. Ha ha, who knows? Um, so I do recall testing the, the shutter speeds on these and they were just all over the place. They're supposed to be like one one hundredth, but no, I don't, I think that's like the one number that they never actually hit. So, um, the flash sync on this speed is the shutter speed for the models that have a flash PC port. Not all of them did, but some of them did right here. The target market for this Umeka DX3 would have been kids and toy camera enthusiasts. Many, many of these cameras exist under different names. Um, some of those names are probably pretty poorly documented because the company that made this was not one that would have kept tons of records. We'll, we'll, we'll cover this. There's a similar a similar type of camera called the Chicago Cluster Camera here in the U.S. This is like the Chinese version of Chicago Cluster Cameras. 
they are just all over under tons of different names, and there's just not great documentation about what all of the different names were. There are often many minor differences in these cameras based on things like when they were made. This Yumeka is definitely older than this Bell & Howell. It's got a lot more metal in it. This Bell & Howell is almost entirely plastic. The housing on the Yumeka is metal. This is all plastic. So this is a significantly younger and much, much, much lighter. And instead of having a flash PC port, you might notice it has a hot shoe. Well, actually this has a hot shoe as well. Anyway, okay, back to the script. These Yumekas and their, their many, many clones do have some elements that limit their appeal to toy grade camera enthusiasts. Those will be things like there's no ability to take double exposures with this camera. There's also no bulb mode if your camera works correctly. There is a single shutter speed and that's it. One of the interesting things about this camera, let me, okay, one of the interesting things about this camera is the aperture. Now this is a lens, this lens is, came off of the Citicon. Here we are. So you can see there the aperture. If I turn this lens, that aperture doesn't actually open and close. It's like an angled slice out of the metal and it rotates and that's what controls the aperture. So uh, yeah, that really makes for some jarring out of focus area characteristics, I'm not gonna lie. Also, these cameras are known to have excessive light leaks and unpredictable results. Uh, I think I think I stole this from one of the Wikipedia or Camerapedia entries that it makes Lomography and Holga cameras look like precision engineered rocket engine components by comparison. So when I got this, um, I opened it up and somebody had in put light seals into it. Not me. Uh, I, the, these yarn light seals were already in there. There was a foam rubber thing here that I replaced with black felt, but um, somebody had already gone to the trouble of correcting the light leaks on this. Both this Bell and Howell and the Umeka didn't really exhibit light leaks when I used them, so even though they have a reputation for that, I'm going to suggest that it might be unearned or easily remediable if you put in some light seal material in the um, film back channels. As for production, these were maybe made in Taiwan. These are from a group of, ca of cameras called, uh, made by New Taiwan, and they are called the Taiwan 35 cameras. They were made from the, in the 80s and 90s. And basically, like I said, this is the chi uh, Chinese equivalent of the Chicago cluster. So these were all, as far as I can tell, the Yumeka does not say where it was made, but the Bell and Howell does. And it was made in Macau, which is in China. Uh, and the Yumeka was made in the mid 80s. And so far as I can tell, and the Bell and Howell would have been a 90s camera. You can tell a little bit by the styling, it's a little bit different. Plus it's lighter and it's all, almost all plastic. So um, this would have been a later version. Also, the Bell and Howell works much better. So as we do, let's go over the camera's things on them so that you can know what everything is. Uh, though we're on the top, we're gonna start technically on the sides with the camera strap lugs right here, which is where you would attach your camera strap. Oh, you might notice here the film rewind. Uh, this is the film rewind knob right here for rewinding your film. This is not what they originally looked like. Uh, these were originally black plastic that looked similar to this silver one. This is silver, pla uh, plastic. This was a black plastic one that absolutely shattered the first time I tried to re uh, rewind film with this camera. And so I put the uh, film rewind knob from an AE-1 on it, and that works significantly better. Flash hot shoe, shutter release button right here, frame count window with a manual reset button right here. So after you load the film, you would just reset your frame counter, and we'll see how to do that later in this video. On the camera's front, we have the brand, the viewfinder window, the make-believe light meter, the model, flash PC port on some models right here, and your lens. On top of the lens, we have an aperture selection, sunny, partly sunny, and cloudy. Sunny, partly sunny, and cloudy, and at least tells you that that's f16, 11, and 8. I might not put tons of faith into how accurate those aperture number calculations are solely because um, the aperture is shaped like a wedge and not a circle. On the camera's back, we have the viewfinder window, the film rewind switch, the film advance dial right here, the film back. We'll get inside of this in just a second. On the camera's bottom, we have the film back release and the tripod socket. 
to open up the film back, we're simply going to push this lever downward. Except on newer models of the Taiwan 35 cameras, where you push the button upward, and that opens the film back. Inside the camera, these are all going to be functionally the same, and I'll grab the, the bell and howl so you can see that. There are some very, very minor differences here. Film cassette chamber here, shutter window, film take-up sprocket, film take-up spool, film pressure plate, cassette retaining sponge. Here, you can see that it's got everything except the cassette retaining sponge. I'm going to guess it fell out at some point. Um, the major difference between these two cameras, this has a flat film transport area, and this has a curved film transport area. Now, functionally, this is actually a flat film transport area because the film comes out and then it engages the sprocket, and that's going to keep it flat and pressed just up against here. And yes, if you are curious, that does give the Umeca a very, very distinct outline of the frame because the geometry of this curved box does not align perfectly with what's touching the film. So on the Bell and Howell, it's a perfect rectangle. On this, it is a weird shape uh, towards the perimeters up here and here. Makes it kind of easy to tell what camera you were using uh, when you get your negatives back, though. So while we have the camera back open, let's just go ahead and load film, and I'll, I'll be able to show you what, what I mean when I say that the, uh, the film is just not lining up with the uh, shutter box area. It might be kind of hard to see from your angle, but this film is flat-ish. Okay, we're going to call it flat, right, as it gets pulled out. And you can see, I hope, there's a little bit of a gap here and here where the curve of the, of the shutter box plane is not aligning with the film. So to load your film, you pull out your leader, and you're going to slide it into there, into that little take-up area. Trigger your shutter. Unless this camera is perfectly upright, the shutter will not trip the release on the film take-up. And all of that work was for naught because the film fell out. Again, of course it did. This would not be one of my videos without the film falling out of the take-up spool at least a dozen times. So let's just do that with the bell and howl, because the process is exactly the same. What you're going to do is you're going to shove the film rewind post upward, put the film in, drop the post back down, load the film into the take-up spool, you don't actually need that much of a leader. That is uh, sloppy work on my part. Gonna load the film into the take-up spool. So fiddly. All right, there we go. That's working. Okay. And this is what it should look like after the film has been taken up on the spool a little bit. Now we're gonna close it. You can see here that this does not have an automatically resetting frame counter. So whether you're using the Umeca or the Bell & Howell, you need to reset your frame count to just a little bit below, before zero. Okay, so same thing here. There we go. There's a red dot after 36, and that'll be just fine to reset it to. And now we're going to go one more just for good measure. So you'll want to try to advance it at least two, just to make sure that none of your film gets ruined. And I'll show, basically I'll pop this open real quickly now. Once you load film, it's one and done. Don't ever open the film back until you've completely used your roll of film and then completely re rewound it. We'll go through the process in a little bit, but basically what happens when you advance film, it just pulls it out of here. So you can actually legitimately just advance one frame with this camera and be fine, because you can see how close the edge of this cassette is to the shutter window right here. And this is where this this is where the protection for the film ends. Okay, so we're gonna go back to zero, or back to one. We're gonna pretend we've we've advanced it to the proper place. We're on the first frame. Take a picture. Just gonna go through your day taking your pictures, just like that. And the way that film works, like I said, is one and done, is it, the film can record light a single time, and that's it, in a, in a controlled manner, using a proper shutter speed and, ex, and aperture, or an uncontrolled manner like this. Opening your film back with the film in the camera will erase all of your photos, whether or not you have taken them. But I want to show you how this process works. So when you push the shutter, we saw the shutter action earlier. The, after you 
you push the shutter release, then you have released some sort of mechanism in here that allows the film to be advanced. As you advance the film, that advances the film a set amount for the whole frame and rearms the shutter so that you can repeat the process. And I said I'd bring out the Citicon here, and well, there's the shutter button with all of the parts missing. Um, but you can see here what's going on as you advance the film. Basically, you, you turn this dial right here on top, and then there's some gearing underneath there. And what that gearing does is it engages the frame counter. There we go. And it also engages some gearing that's still hidden in here that um, prevents it from over being turned too far. But you can see that gearing in action when I get to the end, and it it, it moves the uh, what was used to be the shutter release button right here. This camera just did not work. The shutter on it was completely shot, and that's why I harvested the lens off of it, which is, as you can see from these four screw holes, was pretty easy to do it, literally. I took the uh, leather off, and then it just came right off of here. But yeah, you can see in here also the Citicon, exactly the same as the Umeca inside. Anyway, that has outlived its purpose. So there we go, and that's how the film works. Now, you've gone through your whole day, you've taken your, your photos. Before you open the film back, you have to rewind the film. Oh, and on this model, the film rewind is on the bottom, but if you're using the Umeca, it's up here on the top, of course. Just push the film rewind, and then you have to hold it down the whole time, otherwise it'll re-engage. Push and hold down the film rewind, and then rewind the film. And this is what happens inside the camera when you rewind it. That clicking sound as the film came off of the take-up spool is audible outside of the camera. So then you would completely rewind your film into the cassette like this, like that. And then at that point, you can open up your camera back safely. There we go. All right, so let's get into some more practical things about this camera like how to use a flash. Now in this regard, the Citicon is actually surprisingly capable. It has a flash PC port and a hot shoe, shoe, so you could connect multiple flashes to it if you wanted, or just use an off-camera flash. Off-camera flash is always a better option. We'll get into that in just a minute as to why. So, uh, if you want to use a flash, you're either going to take a flash and connect it to the hot shoe like this, and it, uh, that one, oh, that's why, nope. Oh, that, the hot shoe is really small. It's a lot shorter than usual. Okay, so you just put your flash in, and now you have a flash on top of your camera. This, uh, I do not have a flash cable to demonstrate with, but if you imagine a flash cable coming out of the flash here and connecting to that PC port, now you can have your, cam your flash off of your camera. And then to use the flash, all you have to do is take a picture, and the flash will always fire whenever you take a picture if your camera is working correctly. So why is it a big deal to have this PC port? Well, the worst possible combination of flash and uh, camera is, need some more light, there we go, is this right here. This is the worst, worst possible alignment. Now the reason for this is because when you use a, a flash and you, you discharge the flash, the light leaves the flash, it reaches your subject and it bounces back to the lens. Because the light is coming like this, then it makes your subjects look flat and waxy and that's just not a good look for anyone. When you are, if you, if you only have, if you have a model that only has a hot shoe, you want to try to get an articulating flash that can do this so that you can bounce your flash off of the ceiling. And the reason for that is because when you bounce your flash off the ceiling, the light goes up, reaches the ceiling, comes down to your subject, and then back to your lens. And we perceive that as looking natural because whenever we see someone, whether it's inside, underneath overhead lighting, or outside, underneath a street lamp, or underneath the sun, they're lit from above. So our brains are programmed to see lighting from above as being the normal way that somebody should be illuminated. Okay, so that's that's what you want to do with that. The, it, it, you can also, if you have a flash cable connected to here, even if you have a flash that doesn't articulate, you can hold it like this. And now you have a bounce flash. 
So you can also sculpt your light a little bit. Oh, bounce it off the wall, bounce it off the wall and the ceiling, off the floor, whatever. So having the, the PC port gives you the ability to have a, a flash in your hand to hold with one hand and take a picture with the other. And then you can have a lot of control over the light. And next thing we're going to do is talk about how to take a picture with this camera. You've got your film loaded. You are set to start taking photos. What you're going to do is look through the viewfinder window right here. And that's going to give you an idea of what's going to be in the frame. I might, I might take issue with how accurate that idea is having used both of these cameras. But what you're going to do is sight up your subject. You're going to make sure the aperture is what you want to use. You can see here it's saying that on the widest aperture, that's your flash aperture, which would be correct for any of these cameras. If you're using a flash, you want to use your largest aperture. Take your picture, advance your film. That's the process right there for taking a photo with this camera. There are no double exposures with this camera because as, insofar as I know, all of the Taiwan 35 cameras, and I've owned a couple of others in my life that have all broken and been recycled. Um, and so far as I know, they all have double exposure prevention. So some tips for using your, your Taiwan 35 camera, whether it's the Umeka, the Citicon, the Bell & Howell, or any of the myriad other names that it went by, install light seals in your camera first. So even if, like the Bell & Howell here, is just fine without light seals. It works just fine. But if you were to buy one of these off eBay, I would really say, even though this has pretty deep channels, still install some light seals. I have a video showing how to do that with cotton yarn and some adhesive backed felt. That's a very good way to do it. This you, this one right here has the best light, con, light uh, baffling of any of these that I've ever seen. But any of the Taiwan 35s, I would suggest installing light seals. I would also say use color film, not black and white. These cameras have weird color flares and light leaks and ghosts that they just won't be the same with black and white. And also because of the way that the lenses are constructed out of plastic that's not coated, they will give you super saturated colors. Uh, and that's just something that doesn't translate all that well into black and white. These are really meant for C41 and I would stick with that. And also just appreciate these cameras for what they are and don't expect miracles they're, they're not gonna they're not gonna take amazing photos but they can capture a mood they can capture a moment and they can be a whole lot of fun to use and they are like this one especially is super light the umeka being more metal is not quite as light but honestly they're a lot of fun and as long as you treat them that way i think you'll be in good shape some camera don'ts things not to do with your camera do not store it with the shutter ready to fire. So even though these are, are inexpensive cameras, always trigger your shutter before you set it aside for the night because it is still spring operated and the springs still can develop memory. In fact, that's why my Citicon had a dead shutter because the springs had lost all of their, all of their uh, ability to get tension. Other than that, don't leave your camera in a plastic bag or box because humidity can cause fungus to grow in the, in the covering or on the optics. Uh, the optics not a huge risk because they're not coated. The covering is a bit more of a risk and that will make it smell mildewy. And, and even though it's not a precision tool, it is still fun. So as long as you take care of your, your Umeka or Taiwan 35 camera writ large, your camera will take care of you. Thank you for watching this video. Please give me a thumbs up. That lets me know that I'm on the right track producing content which is useful and helpful to you. If you have any questions or comments, please leave those in the comments section below. I'm pretty good about checking these every couple of days and answering questions. If you have any suggestions or ideas for future videos, and if I have the technical know-how and equipment, I'm more than happy to make those. One last thing, thank you everyone for watching and I'll see you in the next video. I gotta get up, Steinbeck. I have to turn off the camera.